Our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Maureen Santelli, is an associate professor of history at Northern Virginia Community College. She earned undergraduate degrees in history and classics at the University of Montana and a master's and a PhD degree at George Mason University. The subject of her PhD thesis was the influence of the Greek Revolution in America, which is also the subject of her lecture this afternoon and the subject of her recent book, The Greek Fire, American Ottoman Relations and Democratic Fervor in the Age of Revolutions. Dr. Santelli has completed fellowships at George Washington's Mount Vernon at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and the Library Company of Philadelphia. She also has worked with the National Park Service as an interpreter and historian. Before giving the screen to Professor Santelli, I would like to mention, after the lecture, we will have a session with questions and answers. You can type your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. This is going to open another screen on which you can type your questions either during the lecture or after the end of the lecture. Those who they attend the event on Facebook, they can type their questions on the comments box, which is located at the bottom of the screen on the left or the bottom. Professor Sandeli, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And I just want to take a minute to say thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And it's been so great meeting you face-to-face -to -face to, to, such that it is, right, in, in this uh, particular medium. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get that posted up here. Let's see if I can. Oh. Okay, there we go. All right. So um, the uh, topic of my lecture today is begun in Greece and culminated in our American Civil War, abolitionism, and the Greek Revolution. Franklin Benjamin Sanborn, abolitionist and friend of Samuel Gridley Howe, a Philhellen, offered perhaps the best synthesis of the importance of the Greek cause within antebellum reform. Sanborn was a school teacher from Concord, Massachusetts in 1857, when he joined a radical abolitionist group devoted to raising funds in support of John Brown and other anti-slavery residents of Kansas. The radical group of abolitionists was small and included his friend Howe. Later renamed the so-called Secret Six, Sanborn and the other members of the group began to provide assistance in February 1858 for Brown's next great effort to end slavery in the United States. Brown's plan was to incite an armed slave insurrection, which would begin at Harper's Ferry, Virginia the following year in 1859. Though Brown's slave insurrection was suppressed almost immediately, the event further exacerbated sectional tensions between the North and South. Sanborn was forever associated with this climactic event, which ultimately paved the way toward civil war. Decades later, Sanborn wrote the preface and notes for the collected letters and journals of his dear friend, Samuel Gridley Howe. Sanborn praised his friend for his role in the emancipation of Greece and later within the United States. Howe was a born philanthropist, observed Sanborn, and well aware that the service of mankind often requires political revolutions. Sanborn went on to state that Howe's devotion to the anti-slavery cause in the 19th century had begun in Greece and culminated in our American Civil War. Reflecting on the legacy of the Greek Revolution and the aftermath of the Civil War from the vantage point of the early 20th century, Sanborn viewed the progress toward abolition in the United States from a global perspective. To Sanborn, at least, the abolition of slavery in the United States could not have been accomplished without the influence of the Greek War of Independence. The Greek Revolution drew the attention of most early beginning in 1821. 
at first inspired by a transatlantic phenomenon known as the Philhellenic movement, many Europeans and Americans supported the prospect of a Greek nation. Early Americans imagined themselves to be politically and ideologically connected with ancient Greece and wished to release the modern Greeks from the Ottoman Empire. And we, we see this uh, classical influence in early American uh, political thought. Almost immediately after the American Revolution, Americans were trying to distance themselves from a, a, a British identity. So they're, they're searching for a new ancestry, if you will. And initially they adopt more of a Roman Republican identity, but over the course of the first few decades of uh, the early Republic, Americans increasingly began to embrace more and more of the ancient Greek perspective, uh, democracy, that influence becomes especially prevalent moving into the 18 teens, 1820s. And um, I believe that this is one major reason for why Americans so supported um, the modern Greeks and their revolution. Phil Hollens joined efforts with benevolence and missionary groups and together they promoted humanitarianism, education reform and evangelism. Um, just very briefly, uh, benevolence groups uh, were uh, especially focused around uh, church circles. Women were especially involved in these, for example. Um, women were not socially um, allowed to participate in public circles, certainly not political circles. But if a reform effort had to do with supporting aid for destitute mothers or children, then it was considered to be socially acceptable for women to be a part of a more public um, outreach. And uh, the Greek War for Independence actually provided them an international stage, sort of humanitarian efforts. The redemption of the Greeks by various pro-Greek organizations assumed a secularized missionary spirit, which endeavored to spread an American understanding of freedom, liberty, and Christianity to all parts of the world. Greek relief efforts were led by the classical scholar and philanthropist Edward Everett and was supported by countless community groups throughout the country. Long after the Greek Revolution had ended in 1832, the ideas and tactics of the Philhellenic movement contributed to the growing momentum of the American abolitionist movement. Before abolitionism became a popular movement in the United States, many early Americans viewed slavery as it existed in the Muslim world to be abhorrent. The popularity of captivity tales, which described the experiences Westerners had had as captives in the Muslim world, informed and sustained negative feelings towards the Ottoman Empire and Muslims in general. Um, captivity tales were part of a, a very popular and thriving genre in the United States, stretching back to the 18th century, um, both uh, uh, British as well as Americans had uh, found themselves enslaved in the, the Barbary states and their stories uh, were printed pretty widely in the United States and it, it definitely fostered this uh, uh, sort of sentiment towards the Ottoman Empire that the Ottomans were the ultimate antithesis of what it meant to be American. And again, that's also part of the public consciousness of why support Greece. African-American publications referenced the Greek cause with frustration and appealed to their readers to recognize the similarities between the life of a Greek under Ottoman rule and the life of an African slave under a Southern master's rule. Several articles were published in the first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, at the height of the Greek cause's popularity. With reference to the Greek cause, one author pointed out, it would be instructive to take any of the addresses, speeches, or resolutions made on that occasion and to see how many of the most odious features of Turkish slavery may be fairly matched in this free and enlightened country. So from the get-go, we see abolitionist circles asking themselves, how can we make the Philhellenic movement useful to our own efforts? The author continued with their own comparison between slavery and Greece in America and concluded that given the amount of support the Greeks had recently enjoyed, what generous mind would not rather be the Greek than the Black? 
Another article written more than a year later observed, in the midst of these nations who call themselves the friends of liberty and humanity, involuntary servitude is justified, while it is even a problem, whether the understanding of Negroes be of the same species with that of white men. And I just realized I forgot to put up my slides and my apologies, I'm so focused on, on uh, what I wanna say. So really briefly, um, this first slide is uh, Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. At the time that he penned the preface for Samuel Gridley Howe's uh, memoirs, I like the images I show, I, I like to try and show what the author looked like when they were actually um, saying and thinking the things that I'm talking about. So um, here over on the right is a portrait of Samuel Gridley Howe who had a long life as a philanthropist in the United States after his initial efforts in um, Greece. And here he is depicted as a, uh, a, a soldier in the Greek army. Let's see, where did I leave off? <laughs> um, oh, there we go. So still another example of an African-American abolitionist using the Greek cause as a rhetorical tool was David Walker. Printed in 1829, Walker's radical pamphlet appeal to the colored citizens of the world, rallied both free and enslaved African-Americans to stand up to the institution of slavery. Walker, who was born free, um, but very much uh, opinionated on the issue of abolitionism um, and was considered a radical in his time, uh, poignantly observed that while reading a South Carolina newspaper, he came across an article stating, the Turks are the most barbarous people in the world. They treat the Greeks more like brutes than human beings. Alongside this article was an advertisement that said, eight well-built Virginia and Maryland Negro fellows and four wenches will be positively be sold this day to the highest bidder. For Walker, the disconnect between condemning a foreign institution of slavery while supporting a domestic one was unpalatable. Walker concluded by directing his arguments toward white Americans and warned that they could not hide their hypocrisy from God, even though you can hide it from the, West of the rest of the world by sending out missionaries and by your charitable deeds to the Greeks. Contrasting popular interest in Greece was the lack of interest in the issue of American slavery proved to make for a powerful comparison. If the Turks, were indeed barbaric for holding slaves. What made American slaveholders so different? For Walker and others, racial differences did not provide sufficient justification. If Americans could see the similarity between the Greeks and African slaves, then it would be clear that the institution itself was the problem, not the racial characteristics of the slaves. Perhaps the most famous white abolitionist of the antebellum era almost made his humanitarian debut as an American Philhellenic soldier. William Lloyd Garrison was just 20 years old when the Greek cause in America was at its height of popularity. Caught up in the midst of the pro-Greek fervor, Garrison, like many other youths of the time, aspired to defend the Greeks by joining the Greek army. Although the budding abolitionists ultimately decided not to join the Greek forces, Philhellenic rhetoric, however, stayed with Garrison throughout his life. For example, in 1831, so roughly around the time that this portrait was done of Garrison, Garrison openly accused his countrymen of being hypocrites for supporting the Greeks while forsaking African slaves. In a piece titled The Insurrection, which was printed in Garrison's publication, The Liberator, Garrison reprimand. Mommy. I'm sorry, forgive me. My my daughter has decided to crash this. I need to. Mommy wants you to put this on. Oh my goodness. This is the age of COVID, right? My apologies. Um, in a piece titled The Insurrection, which was printed in Garrison's publication, The Liberator, Garrison reprimanded his contemporaries who feared slave insurrection and flatly stated that African slaves did not need to be pushed into insurrection by abolitionist influence. And that was the, the huge concern about so-called radicals like Garrison or even David Walker, that uh, their writings would make their way into the deep South and slaves would get a hold of this literature 
and all of a sudden they'd realize that slavery is bad, like as if they didn't already know it. And all of a sudden that they'd, they'd want to rebel against their slave masters. So instead, they could find an incentive in their stripes, in their emaciated bodies, in their ceaseless toil. Garrison continued his accusation of hypocrisy by pointing out that most Americans had applauded the Greek insurrection and observed that African slaves deserve no more censure than the Greeks. Garrison's writing, especially his insurrection article, created controversy wherever it was reprinted. In both the North and South, uh, we see these articles uh, sprouting up. One Portsmouth, Maine newspaper reported, for example, that North Carolinians were especially up in arms, demanding in 1831 that anyone who circulated the Liberator ought to be barbecued. The Portsmouth Journal made a similar historical connection as Garrison had with the Greek Revolution, pointing out that if the Liberator would incite insurrection in the South, then the North Carolina Free Press should also stop publishing pieces about liberty and equality and, quote, rejoicing at the success of the Greeks. So again, we see this, this reference to the Greek Revolution and calling out uh, Southern slave masters for holding slaves themselves. Something had changed. When the Greek Revolution first began in 1821, Americans had seldom connected the abolition of Greek slavery with the condition of slavery in the United States. Citizens of the American South rejected any link between the plight of the Greeks and that of their own slaves. The spreading desire for freedom would eventually come to the American South, predicted abolitionist newspapers, and African slaves would, like their Greek counterparts, revolt. The national consensus behind supporting the Greek cause was becoming a distant memory by the 1830s and was instead joining with the divisive political rhetoric of the antebellum era. To recall the tyranny of the Turks was to summon the ultimate definition of despotism in the contemporary world. The Greek cause became a part of a reformist legacy, linking the progression of these antebellum reform movements to a global story rather than just a domestic one. An important way in which the rhetoric of the Philhellenic movement was adopted by abolitionist groups was through the unveiling of Hiram Powers' statue, The Greek Slave. Here it's uh, depicted on an exhibition in New York, and I'll speak a little bit more about it, but please note in this image, there are not just men present, but women. Again, this is a big deal for women to be out in a public space viewing a nude statue. Also, please note that there are also children present using, viewing this, slit, this uh, statue. Anticipated for two years, Power's masterpiece finally arrived in New York in August of 1847. The Greek slave was the first nude statue to be accepted by the American public, in part because of the subject matter, that it depicted a young Christian Greek girl on a Turkish auction block. The statue toured the United States and was viewed by thousands of Americans, both male and female, throughout the country, stimulating social debate wherever it went. The work compelled many Americans to recall their support for the Greek Revolution, their disdain for Ottoman slavery, and the status of women both at home and abroad. The image of the Greek slave could no longer inspire unity as the American Philhellenic movement had in the 1820s, but rather it now represented the feelings of political and sectional division that plagued antebellum America. For many Americans, the Greek slave did not merely conjure images of the Greek revolution and the struggle of innocent civilians. The Greek slave stood as an idealized symbol of freedom, an image that highlighted the degree to which American society fell short of their ideal. Frederick Douglass's paper captured this sentiment best. And here's Frederick Douglass uh, in 1847, roughly at about the same time that this statue made its way to New York and when he's uh, uh, discussing his ideas concerning the statue. In a review, the author described the statue in great detail and offered emotional reaction to seeing the innocent young girl in chains. And again, this is in Frederick Douglass's paper. Um, this article does not have an author given, but it is possible that it is Frederick Douglass, or at the very least, Frederick Douglass would have had to have seen this article before it was signed off on to be printed in the paper. So, um, the article states, 
how heart and brain burn with the hatred for the cruel Turk who does thus violate the sacred rights of human nature. And to this feeling heart and discerning eye, all slave girls are Greek and all slave mongers Turks. Their country, Algiers or Alabama, Congo or Carolina, the same. The North Star reviewed, con, uh, review concluded that such was the power of viewing the Greek slave, that had Congress appropriated 10 millions of dollars to buy the silent moral mentor and given it a place in the halls where so much crime has been legalized and connived at, ours would have been wiser and a better nation. Many Americans saw in the statue, not just the plight of a young Greek girl, but a larger injustice. If the owner of this young Greek girl was cruel and despotic, then so too was any individual who stole away the innocence and freedom of another. There were many other reviews of the Greek slave that echoed similar sentiments. Another anti-slavery publication reviewed Power's statue and observed that in so doing, a yet deeper moral is there for Americans. It is an impersonification of slavery. This creature exhibited for sale in the slave market is a counterpart of thousands of living women. Every day does our own sister city of New Orleans witness similar exposures with a similar purpose. The author of the article concluded with the hope, would that the Greek slave as she passes through the various portions of our country might be endowed with power to teach, to arouse, to purify public opinion. Yet another publication printed in their review of the statue that while power's image enchants the world, there were fair breasts that heave with genuine sympathy beneath the magic power of the great Greek, excuse me, great artists that have never yet breathed a sigh for the sable sisterhood of the South. May many a mother and daughter of the Republic be awakened to a sense of the enormity of slavery as it exists in our own midst. These reviews clearly indicate that for many Americans who flocked to see the Greek slave, they not only saw the statue as a beautiful work of art or as a political statement against slavery within the Ottoman Empire, but also that it was an indictment against slavery within power's own home country. Some anti-slavery advocates in the United States even argued that a slave's condition was better within the Ottoman Empire than in their own country. It is important to note that by the time the statue was unveiled in the 1840s, parts of the Ottoman Empire had begun to limit and even outlaw the enslavement of certain groups of people. Americans were aware of this and condemned the United States for not taking similar measures. One, one newspaper commented on this irony given the popularity of the Greek slave stating, it brings home to us the foulest feature of our national sin and the still more humiliating fact that while the accursed system from which it springs has well nigh ceased in Mohammedan countries. It still taints a portion of our Christian soil and is at this very moment clamoring that it may pollute yet more. Like abolitionists in the late 1820s using popular Philhellenic rhetoric to advance their arguments, Power's statue now served a similar purpose. What is clear is that mid-century abolitionists recognized that after several years of national notoriety and fame, the Greek slave could serve as a powerful point of contrast and comparison between the United States and the Ottoman Empire. Most American Southerners did not see the relevance of connecting the Greek slave with slavery as it existed within the United States. Many Southern newspapers reported to their readers the progression of the Greek slave's travels through the United States, the reactions that the statue inspired from locals, and the hope for its continued success. The Southern Patriot printed a series of articles from the time of the statue's arrival in New York in 1847, each declaring that the statue had safely arrived in the United States, that it was to be put onto public display immediately, and again, followed it from city to city. Yet another Southern newspaper reported on the reception of the statue and um, stated that it is a splendid specimen of American art. And again, there's just no reference at all to uh, recognizing that, that connection to slavery in the United States. The Mississippi Free Trader, another Southern newspaper, reported on the arrival of the statue in Natchez in 1851, stating that 
we are confident locals will crowd the rooms to see the life-size form of the manifold maiden, so intense in passion and apparent mental suffering as to make the cold marble appeal to the human heart as forcibly as if her tears and voice were palpable to the senses. In fact, in October 1847, at the request of a New Orleans doctor, the Greek slave, which was owned at the time by Powers' uh, close friend, Minor Kellogg, was used as a means for raising funds to benefit the sufferers by the pestilence of New Orleans. There was a, a plague of sorts uh, going around in New Orleans and they were using it to fundraise. That many Southerners saw the Greek slave as a beacon of hope and an example of unparalleled paralleled art by an American artist is undeniable. Whether they saw a connection to power statue and slavery as it existed within the, within the South is doubtful, however. At least any reviews printed in Southern newspapers and magazines remain silent on the subject. Some reviews printed by abolitionist publications declared their hope that when the statue traveled through the American South, um, it would change the hearts of slaveholders who looked upon the statue. One such article printed by this national era speculated what impression they hoped the Greek slave might have on a, a on a St. Louisan slaveholder. I am gazing upon an image as white as the driven snow, says a potential slaveholder who had come to see Power's masterpiece. And, and in view of the wrongs of the kind she represents, contemplating complete emancipation of all the white people of the earth under the genial influence of Christianity. And I cannot have my thoughts perturbed by the intrusion of such black and thick lipped images as these I see flitting before my eyes of imagination. Away, away, I came not to think of ebony maidens or men or what humanity requires for them, but to be regaled with the elevating and humanitizing sentiments which I dreamed this image should inspire me with. The reviewer fantasized that the Greek slave might turn on its pedestal to the slaveholder and say in response, why limit your sympathies? I was carved from Parian rather than from Ebony, that I might more effectually appeal to perverted justice and partial sympathy. But I am the representation of the captive and the forsaken everywhere. And whatever sympathy I may secure for my enslaved sisters in Turkey are due to my sisters of another hue and the land throughout which I, make, I am making my pilgrimage. As is made clear by the National Era Review, the comparison between the, the Greek slave and slavery within the United States was, was an obvious one, but the comparison was invalid in the minds of uh, Southerners. And I'm gonna show this image here. Um, so the defense of slavery in the American South was part of a longstanding tradition that had become solidified by the Missouri crisis in 1820 and was a foundational part of the Southern way of life. So what we have here is um, an image taken from uh, a book printed in 1854 called From Types of Mankind by Naughton Glidden. And it's, it basically categorizes the so-called races and makes the argument that whites are of course superior, whereas any other races in the world are inferior. Here we have specifically uh, a reference to the Apollo Belvedere as the representation of the perfection of whiteness and a comparison then to um, a, a, a obviously a personified African-American and then they're being compared to a chimpanzee. I mean, it's obviously just a, extremely racist, uh, just horrific to even behold. But this is in effect how Southerners perceived the races in the mid 19th century. And they had justified the continuation of slavery on the basis that whites were superior, that they are in, in effect doing a, uh, a service to um, African slaves because they supposedly couldn't possibly fend for themselves if they were given their freedom. And, uh, and, and the book, you know, allegedly is, is supposed to be providing support for that argument. And here we have a reference to a Greek statue, and actually it's, it's now confirmed it's a Roman one, but it was thought to be a copy of a Greek statue 
And it was thought that uh, Greek statuary from the ancient world was the perfection of what human beings should look like. And of course, what white human beings should look like. Pro-slavery arguments only became more intensified by the 1830s as Northern abolitionist societies increasingly began publishing indictments against slavery in publications such as William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. In addition, the Greek slave was thought of as a white woman about to be sold into slavery to presumably a non-white male. By condemning the enslavement of whites in the world, Southerners could simultaneously defend a global concept of freedom while still defending black slavery at home. This so-called racial Hellenism must also therefore be understood when considering Southern reactions to power as Greek slave. From the Southern perspective, white Americans shared not only a cultural link to antiquity with the Greeks, but also whiteness. Greek enslavement was therefore unnatural. Rather than change the hearts and minds of slaveholders, as was hoped by the National Era reporter, the article would have only been viewed as a challenge to Southern liberty and an insult to their honor. British subjects also speculated what impact, if any, the Greek slave might have on the persistence of slavery in the United States, or at least noted the hypocrisy of its continuation. In 1851, a copy of the Greek slave was sent to England to appear in the Crystal Palace exhibition. The Greek slave influenced John Tenniel's cartoon printed in the British periodical Punch. The cartoon was titled The Virginia Slave, and depicted a nude African woman standing in a similar way to Power's work of art. Draped over the post to which the Virginia slave was chained was an American flag. At the base of the statue, the words E Pluribus Unum were clearly chiseled. So of course the motto of the United States, it's all in all of our money, right? The caption for the cartoon read, intended as a companion to Power's Greek slave. Tenniel's critique received even more notoriety when a fugitive American slave attended the exhibition with the purpose of making an anti-slavery demonstration in the presence of the Greek slave. When he arrived, the fugitive placed a copy of the Virginia slave nearby the Greek slave, stating, as an American fugitive slave, I place this Virginia slave by the side of the Greek slave as its most fitting companion. British anti-slavery society circles, like their American counterparts, criticized American enthusiasm for power statue. Members of the anti-slavery society of London, who viewed the Greek slave at the Crystal Palace, were especially disgusted. One member named Reverend Thomas Baloney observed that the Americans who visited the exhibit, exhibit must have been struck with a, with a sort of judicial blindness in the selection. In choosing the Greek slave to represent the United States, an American artist, it exhibited the worst taste possible, especially given that in addition to this, they also placed a man with a stick to turn the Greek slave round, precisely as they would do were they trafficking in human sinew and bone. So apparently in order for uh, people coming to the exhibit to see the full statue, um, there was somebody actually there uh, turning the statue around so that you could see the full thing. And that, that's what they're, they're commenting on here. As was the case when Northern, Northerners critiqued Southerners, when the British brought up slavery and its persistence in the United States, it usually only further entrenched slavery as a supposedly peculiar aspect to life in the American South. It's, that was typically their their response, they would say, well, you don't understand, you don't live in the South, you, you don't know what it's like, uh, mind your own business, essentially. While the Greek slave did not change many Southern minds toward abolition, it was certainly adopted into abolitionist rhetoric and aided in the intensification of their arguments. In the years leading up to the American Civil War, the legacy of the Philhellenic movement continued to play a part in sectional politics. This legacy is evident in Senator Charles Sumner's White Slavery in the Barbary States, published in 1853. While the title indicates the work was intended to be a history of slavery in the Barbary States, 
the anti-slavery sympathizer repeatedly used Turkish slavery as a comparison to slavery in the American South. By referring to the South as the Barbary States of America, Sumner offered a multitude of points of comparison um, to the Barbary States that is, including that Virginia, Carolina, Mississippi, and Texas should be the American complement to Morocco, Algiers, Tripoli, and Tunis. In addition, the Barbary states occupy, quote, nearly the same parallels with the slave states of our union. With the slaves' long catalog of humiliation and woes not yet complete, Sumner's history of the Barbary states illustrated that the system of slave slavery Phil Hollens had so reviled decades earlier was really not dissimilar to the system they themselves allowed to continue within their own borders. Some refugees from Greece made the case themselves that Greek and African-American enslavement was the same issue, giving the American abolitionist movement an expanded international perspective. At least three active members of the abolitionist movement, Photius Fisk, John Zakos, and Joseph Stefanini, in which I, do, I don't have an image of Stefanini, were Greek youths rescued by American Philhellens and brought to the United States. Um, one, uh, one mechanism that abolitionist groups would frequently use would, would be to um, recruit former African slaves and, um, and have them speak about their experiences as slaves in the South to lend a more personal and uh, human connection to what slavery was like in the South. So Frederick Douglass, for example, is a famous, um, a, a famous uh, example. Uh, John Zakos and Photius Fisk, especially Photius Fisk, um, provide a, another perspective, a more international perspective on this. It's slavery, no matter where it is, is, is the same thing. Joseph Stefanini believed he had a unique perspective on the subject given that he had experienced Ottoman slavery firsthand. Ottoman soldiers captured Stefanini while his village was under attack early on in the war. For several years, he lived as a captive, not knowing whether he would ever see his family again. Through a series of fortunate events, Stefanini managed to escape his captors and gain passage on an American ship bound for New York. Arriving in New York, Stefanini was taken under the wing of the New York Greek Committee. The New York Greek Committee was the most powerful and influential uh, Phil Hellenic groups in the United States. They became the central collection point uh, nationally for contributions to the Phil Hellenic cause. And they orchestrated a lot of the actual sending of aid directly to Greece. They also facilitated um, agents from the US to Greece, including Samuel Gridley Howe and, and others. The group granted him passage on a ship that was sending back to the Mediterranean stocked with relief items for the suffering Greeks. Stefanini became a Greek committee representative of sorts. Almost immediately, he returned to the United States on another American ship carrying correspondence for the Greek committee in Boston. And this was a very common thing. Uh, so um, these American Greek committees did stay pretty up to date on what was happening in Greece. On the second visit to the United States, Stefanini remained for several years visiting supporters of the Greek cause in Charleston, South Carolina, which is sort of an interesting place for him to be, given that, of course, slavery is pretty prevalent there. It was on this visit to a Southern slaveholding state that Stefanini saw for himself the American institution of slavery. The former Greek slave attempted to keep his language uncontroversial by observing how much he admired America for their assistance to the Greek cause. He concluded his memoir, however, by referring to African slavery stating the emancipation of a family from the miseries of slavery, a, sliver, a slavery of whose horrors I can speak from bitter experience is an enterprise which such a people, meaning the United States, I confidently trust will not refuse to aid. Stefanini's memoir written and sold specifically to raise money to help him return to Greece to find his enslaved family concluded on an abolitionist note. Given his understanding of Americans and their dedication to Greek freedom, he believed that the American people would be moved to eradicate slavery from their borders. Stefanini was a poor, uh, young, poor refugee who just a few years earlier had not been able to speak a word of English. There are questions about how much of the memoir he wrote himself. 
Nonetheless, the young Greek achieved national fame. Through the help of Phil Hellens in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, he traveled throughout the United States. Several newspapers reported on his travels. The Vermont Gazette printed that while unwilling to accept charity, Stefanini intended to publish a memoir that would help to raise ransom money to free his mother and sisters. The whole effort would be done in Charleston with the assistance of an unnamed South Carolinian. Published in 1829, Stefanini's memoir was advertised as being a true story, no doubt intended to aid in selling more copies. To say the memoir was a true story was not enough. Following the preface, several well-known American men included letters of introduction for the young Greek refugee. The only South Carolinian who wrote a letter for the book or who was thanked by Stefanini by name in his conclusion was Thomas S. Grimke. Thomas S. Grimke was the son of a wealthy South Carolina slaveholder and the brother of Sarah and Angelina Grimke, both of whom would emerge as outspoken advocates of the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s. Thomas Grimke was a respected lawyer as well as philanthropist, serving as a member of the American Colonization Society and the American Peace Society. The American Colonization Society, by the way, is it, it was an abolitionist society. Harriet Beecher Stowe, for example, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, was, um, at least for a time, an advocate of the colonization movement. Grimke was not specifically named as the South, Carolin South Carolinian who assisted Stefanini in editing his manuscript for publication. However, Grimke had at least some input. I'm sorry. You need to go find Maggie. You need to go find Maggie. I cannot help you right now. Well, you need to go go ask her. I can't help you. My apologies again. Go ask Maggie. However, Grimke had at least some input. His letter of introduction for the memoir stated that he had examined Stefanini's letters and therefore recommended him with pleasure to all who feel a sympathy for his personal misfortune. Joseph Stefanini managed to collect enough proceeds from his memoir to leave the United States in order to return home to Greece. Again, my apologies. This is life with a four-year-old um, and my not having my own office. I'm sorry. Other Greek refugees who arrived in the United States permanently claimed it as their new home. These Greek refugees were mere children when they came to America to receive an education sponsored by local Greek committees. Though they became American citizens, Photius Fisk and John Zakos carried their experiences from the Greek Revolution into adulthood. Photius Fisk, that he took the uh, uh, name of the missionary who uh, found him in Greece and adopted him, came to the United States under the sponsorship of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, as well as Philhellenic Americans. With a brother in the Greek army, Fisk, from an early age, learned to detest every form of slavery. Fisk later became an ordained minister and was named a chaplain in the U.S. Navy in 1841. Throughout his life's work for the abolition of slavery and other philanthropic causes, admirers of Photius Fisk recognized the connection between his devotion to the anti-slavery movement and his experiences with the wrongs imposed upon the people of his country by the Turkish pirates. Fisk. Fisk became well acquainted with William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, and many other members of the anti-slavery movement. Perhaps the most noteworthy was John Brown. Garrison introduced Fisk to John Brown in Boston in 1859, while Brown was making secret arrangements for his raid at Harper's Ferry. Holding Brown to be a true friend of the anti-slavery cause, Fisk contributed $100 to Brown's mission, and $100 in 1859 was a very large sum of money. And again, uh, remembering from the beginning of the lecture, this is the, he's donating money to support a slave insurrection, um, which uh, John Brown ultimately is captured and brought up on charges of treason and is ultimately executed for those charges. John Zakos was another Greek American abolitionist. Zakos was 10 years old when he came to the United States under Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe's care. American Philhellenic patrons paid for the young boy's education and living expenses until he graduated in 1840. He 
He spent most of his life as an educator and school principal. And sadly, there aren't images of these two men um, at the time that they came to the United States. Here they are, of course, uh, you know, distinguished uh, much later in life. During the American Civil War, Zachos worked with the Educational Commission of Boston and New York, traveling to South Carolina in 1862 as part of the Union presence in the region. Zachos assisted with providing education to the newly freed slaves, a venture not dissimilar from the efforts made by benevolence groups for Greek, Greek education in the years that followed the revolution. Um, there were uh, other efforts, and I, it's not a topic I go into uh, here, but just very briefly, um, many of the, the Philhellenic groups of the 1820s end up expanding their efforts at uh, helping to build schools in uh, Greece by the end of the 1820s and 1830s. A news report printed in a New York newspaper related the arrival of the Union forces, as well as the presence of three to 4,000 freed slaves who had assembled to celebrate Emancipation Day. The plentiful supply of abolition speeches included an ode written by John Zachos, declaring of African slaves finally free. Although the Greek cause initially aimed at helping the Greeks as an extension of philanthropic relief abroad, ironically in the end, it transformed American society. Both the rhetoric of the Greek cause and participation in the movement influenced reformers and brought a global perspective to the abolitionist movement. Though the consensus among Philhellenic organizations of the early 1820s was short-lived, the memory of the Greek cause continued to play a pivotal role in American reform through the 19th and into the early 20th centuries. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Santelli, for your very informative lecture. Uh, let me see what questions do we have. Let me first ask uh, a question myself. What was the position of the American government at the time towards the Greek Revolution? So th that's it's a very complicated um, situation. Um, James Monroe, who was president at the time that the war began, um, was a very strong supporter of, of republics in general, but in particular wanted to provide some kind of support to the Greeks, or at the very least be one of the first nations to acknowledge Greek independence. But simultaneously, Americans had been trying to uh, increase their presence on the global stage commercially. And for almost, well, more than 10 years, had been trying to negotiate a trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire. They had been blocked repeatedly because the British did not want Americans to have a, an arrangement with the Ottomans. Um, so while the Greek war is, is beginning, um, the Secretary of State at the time, John Quincy Adams, had already sent a secret agent over to the Sublime Port to make, to renew efforts at negotiating a treaty. So uh, Monroe really holds out for quite a while, um, uh, well over a year. And Adams keeps saying, no, 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 we're, we're, we can't do this. Finally, um, Adams wins out the argument and Monroe in his famous um, uh, State of the Union address that includes uh, the Monroe Doctrine. That's really what most people know about the speech is the, is the Monroe Doctrine. But in that speech, he actually talks about the Greek Revolution. And everybody's kind of expecting him to, to finally say, we're gonna recognize Greek independence. And instead he has this huge letdown where he says, but we're not gonna acknowledge independence. We're just gonna wait. And people were so upset, this is December of 1823, that that really is what touches off a renewed, and I'd say even a more active, involvement in the Philhellenic movement. Uh, Daniel Webster, one week later, comes to uh, Congre the congressional floor and says, wait, what? We need to talk about this. I want to have some debate on this issue. And so we really start seeing localities uh, amping up their efforts at um, supporting the Greeks. But 
Um, the government decides not to do anything because they are so desperate for this uh, trade agreement. Thank you. So the first question from the audience, thank you, Professor Sandeli, for this informative lecture. The connection between the way Southerners view Greek, viewed Greek slavery with that of slavery they condoned was eye-opening. Do you know of any film documentary projects about American Philhellenism or the American Panhellenism uh, and abolitionist? Unfortunately, I do not. And I think that it's, it, it would be such a delightful topic to take on. And then it's obviously it's the crux of my, the argument I make in the book where, I mean, this is something a, a lot of Americans don't know about. And um, the Greek revolution was such an important part of the conversation that was being had. And I think that in our modern age, we tend to think of the abolitionist movement as just being a domestic issue that outside of forces aren't really influencing uh, the civil war or the emergence of the civil war at all. And it's just not the case. Um, and certainly the Greek revolution had a, an influence on that. And I would like to see a, a documentary on the topic. So I'm with you. Okay. Uh, let me pose another question because I don't see very many questions from the audience. Uh, how, how long was the trip at the time from the United States to Greece? Uh, those uh, people from the United States who are friendly to the Greek cause and they wanted to participate, how long did they take them to go over there? And uh, what was the route of the trip? Because I suppose it would not be that easy to reach Greece and uh, especially during the time of the revolution. Yeah, um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head of how long it would take. It would take several weeks um, and typically um, because the United States did not have uh, in a, a negotiated presence in the Mediterranean, um, they tended to have to go under escort from the Mediterranean squadron. So the United States did have some naval ships um, there. And uh, so a lot of these uh, uh, agents from Philhellenic groups would have to go under escort with the U.S. Mediterranean squadron, which um, just as an aside, brought a whole host of other problems because you have the United States who has said, no, 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 we want an, an arrangement with the Ottomans. We're not going to acknowledge uh, the Greek revolution. And uh, meanwhile, the Mediterranean squadron is bringing these agents and supplies to uh, the Greeks. And then it kind of, it, it gummed up the negotiation process because the Sultan basically is just like, what the heck are you guys doing? I, 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 I'm not going to negotiate with you people if you're going to support a rebellion within my borders. So um, yeah, so they would, they would uh, typically make like a stop off in Malta, for example. Um, and again, I don't know the exact timeline, but it would take several weeks. I'm sorry. Uh, the next question is, do you know if any of the Greek orphans yeah. supported slavery? Um, to my knowledge, the, Greek, the, the ones that I know of were uh, supporters of abolitionism. It's not to say that... I'm, I'm unaware of any um, supported slavery, but that's a great question. Okay, um, Stephanie, do you see any questions for Facebook? No, not really. Let me check once again. I answered everybody's no. questions in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions on Facebook. Uh, okay, we have another question it says, uh, when did the US Navy carry the supplies for the Greek revolution? If it did, of course. So initially, um, in the early stages of the war, the United States, these Greek groups um, would send aid via the London Philhellenic Committee, um, but they became increasingly convinced that the London Committee wasn't uh, managing their funds properly. They also wanted the Greeks to know that it's the United States that's sending this stuff, not London. They didn't believe that London, they thought London was maybe taking credit for their efforts. 
So it's by the mid 1820s, we start to see aid um, coming from American ships. Um, and again, that it was a little bit complicated because they, they have to fly under different flags in order to get these uh, supplies to the Greeks to begin with. There is one interesting instance where um, the uh, Greek, the, the provisional uh, Greek deputies came to New York and they commissioned two ships to be constructed for the Greek Navy. And um, basically uh, it's, it's a huge debacle. The uh, shipbuilding company uh, apparently screwed up. Uh, I'm not really clear what they did wrong, but they came back and quoted an astronomical amount of money uh, so much that the, the Greeks couldn't possibly pay for the two ships that they wanted. That generated interest in um, the United States to purchase the ships for the Greeks. And um, that it's, it's as close as the United States gets to aiding Greece directly. Basically what happens is they do some backdoor under the table finagling. The United States Navy purchased one of the ships and it's commissioned into the United States Navy. That then freed up the Greeks to purchase the other ship, which is renamed the Hellas. And it came from the United States with supplies um, from the US. And um, that actually gums up again, the works with negotiating a trade agreement because there's news that comes that, uh, that it's basically this American ship and they're sending all these American soldiers, which wasn't true. But, um, but yeah, I, there, there are various points where they're sending aid and it's, it amounts to tens of thousands of dollars, if not more of, uh, of, of military aid, but then later it's humanitarian aid. Thank you very much. Uh, Costa Zavallorgas just makes a comment. By the way, Professor Thomas Galland had a lecture on the life of Photius Fisk sponsored by UCLA a few weeks ago. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, he's an interesting character. Um, very good. Let me see any other questions, please. Did you, Costa, did you see the questions from Elaine? From Elaine? Yeah. From Opulos? Yeah. Yeah, the question goes, do you know if any of the Greek orphans supported slavery? And I pose the question. And not to my knowledge, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think they, from what I understand, they were they were pretty ardent supporters of ending slavery. Yeah. Um, are any other books written about uh, the connection of uh, between the Greek Revolution and the abolitionism or other free other movements uh, in the United States? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I do know that uh, the influence of the Greek Revolution will come up in like maybe a chapter or two of uh, some academic books, but it's not the main topic. Um, and, so, and not on abolitionism, at least not that I am familiar with. Um, uh, that was kind of my, my, my big connection that I, I felt like I had found in uh, the source material. Yeah. Another question that was communicated to me by phone, any non-government, were there any non-government organizations that were helping the Greek effort at that time? Um, I suppose, in, yeah. In the United yeah. States? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in fact, it's, it's actually kind of surprising that uh, the United States doesn't manage to um, end up sending aid officially because there was such rampant support for the Greek Revolution. I mean, again, like um, Daniel Webster gives one of the most famous speeches in Congress in defense of the Greeks, and it really riles people up. I, people were sending letters to their congressmen demanding that they uh, send aid. I mean, people were willing to raise a lot of money and wanted the government to officially send this. Um, but uh, John Quincy Adams apparently was quite the negotiator. He actually sends, it's uh, Joel Poinsett, the namesake of the Poinsettia, by the way, uh, first ambassador to Mexico. Joel Poinsett was actually a supporter of Greek independence. And he visits Adams and says, listen, 
they want to send an agent. They'd like to send Edward Everett to support the Greeks. Would you at least be willing to do that? And Adams, and this is totally backroom discussion that he writes about it in his journal. Adams says, no, I've already sent a secret agent. If we send Edward Everett, he's a huge partisan. It's going to make huge headlines. It's going to jeopardize the life of my secret agent. And we're just not going to do it. And I, I apparently John Quincy Adams was just uh, knew how to wield power. I, I don't have any other explanation because from what I could see from the source material, um, it, it seemed like it should have happened, but it obviously didn't. I know that there was a, an extensive exchange of letters between uh, Jefferson and Correis. I don't know if you're familiar with Correis. Yes. yes. Did Jefferson take any public uh, position on the issue other than the exchange of these letters? Um, not that I am familiar with, like if he gave like an address or anything, I know. But um, uh, supposedly at the, out, the outset of the war, I mean, he obviously, he dies in 1826. Um, he certainly favored um, the independence of Greece. And it's actually kind of an interesting thing. And it's, it's actually a whole other topic um, where they want to support Greece. But and we get this from Jefferson's letters. It's not just that they wanted to support Greek independence, but they imagined that they could somehow rejuvenate the what they consider to be like the purity of ancient Greece. So he writes extensively about how the modern Greek language is not as pure as the ancient one. And so if we can just get them to uh, get their independence from Turk from the Turks, then you know we can send some people in there and reintroduce ancient Greek. So um, that's a whole other interesting element where it's like they, they kind of wanted to dictate what kind of independence the Greeks would have. In fact, um, I talk a little bit about that in the book too with um, one of the uh, American agent sent by the Greek Committee of New York. He has an audience with Mavrikardatos, um, one of the um, uh, officials for the provisional Greek government. And he says to him, Americans are not going to support you guys if you aren't going to institute a republic. You better not institute a monarchy because we're not supporting that. And um, Mavrikardatos, you know, says, oh, of course we're going to have a republic. We're not going to have a monarchy. Why, how could you su suggest such a thing? And um, he's satisfied with the response. But in reality, the, the, there was already discussion of having the British step in and help negotiate an end of the war. So it, you know, just interesting uh, uh, storylines there. But I suppose the Greeks did not have very much of a choice. Right. It, it would seem that way. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, some people who they say that at some time there was a movement in the United States um, to consider the Greek language as a language of the country. Is that, are you, have you heard anything of that? Have you read anything of this? No, I'm. The, I mean, and I'm not sure. So in the seven, in the late 1700s, there would have been more of a, an emphasis on like Roman, the Romans and Latin. Um, the Greek influence really does not set in until I'd say after 1810. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe there were a, a select few people who were interested in that, but really by 1810, you see more of an interest in offering education on a, a, a wider scale for both men and women. And um, there was a reduced emphasis on Latin and Greek by then. Um, they still wanted people to learn the classics, but read it in English. So um, not to say that there weren't people who maybe suggested that, but as far as I, I, I know, it, was, it would not have been a widespread popular movement. Yeah, I have another question from Men Vasiliu. From the company of uh, Brothel Street Church, John Quincy Adams preferred the influence of Colonel Perkins than of Edward Everett. Does this say to you anything? Uh, what was the, he preferred who to uh, Edward From Perkins? the company of Brothel Street Church, 
John Quincy Adams preferred the influence of Colonel Perkins than of Edward Everett. I suppose she tries to make something between Perkins and Everett. Was any kind of I, I, I mean, I know that from reading um, Adam's letters and his diary, um, he, I don't know what he thought about Edward Everett personally, but he certainly saw Edward Everett as an obstacle um, because he was perceived as the leader of the Philhellenic movement. I mean, I, I know he, he specifically calls him a partisan. Um, he, he saw him as getting in the way of uh, their commercial interests with the Ottoman Empire. And uh, he, I, I think that he did pose some headaches for, for Adams. Very good. Uh, Stefanos, any other questions? I got a question. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, were there any sources trying to compare the degree of um, harshness, let's say, of, this, of the slavery that uh, Greeks suffered under the Turks versus the degree uh, of slavery suffered by the Africans in, the, in America. I was thinking that the Blacks were worse off in general because, for example, their families were being separated, they were being bought and sold. Uh, with the Greeks, there were periods where things were better and periods where things were worse, but in general, they still had a family life and some of them had farms and whatnot. Of course, they paid huge taxes, but right. I wonder if uh, they're comparable, the two slaveries. Um, yeah, so um, I think that what made it, it's, it's not a, obviously a completely accurate view of what slavery was like in the Ottoman Empire and how they're comparing it, right? They're definitely using their perception delivered by like captivity tales and what have you. The Greeks were not enslaved before the, the Greek revolution in the sense that, that Americans were thinking. Um, the, uh, the Greeks, of course, lost the uh, protected status that they had um, prior to the revolution uh, is being declared as a group of people in rebellion within the Ottoman Empire. So I mean, obviously they're, they're, it's not the same. And, um, and, I, and in fact, I, I, at, one, at one point I noted that that is something that abolitionist groups pointed out that it, it is actually worse to be a slave in the American South as opposed to the Ottoman Empire. Um, but I, I think that the Ottomans were in a lot of ways, sort of uh, almost a character characterization of themselves. Um, uh, again, it, it, for, it was decades of this reinforced idea that the Turks are the like the the evil antithesis of the United States, and so that's part of their consciousness in equating slavery uh, in that way. Thank you very much. Any of the other questions, please? Otherwise, you are going to close. Let me see. Let me go to the bottom of the list here. To see if there is anything else. Okay, we have another one from uh, Costa de la Yorgas. Were there any Greek Orthodox officials who were abolitionists? So in the United States, um, the, there really isn't a widespread um, like Greek presence. Um, I, I believe that uh, Greeks, really when you see like a Greek community developing in the United States is not until much later in the 19th century. So these, in fact, these Greek refugees um, were partly famous just because they're, they're Greeks and Americans haven't really seen Greeks before, right? Um, so to my knowledge, no, um, I certainly didn't come across any reference to that. I don't know um, how many Orthodox uh, clergy would have been in the United States up until after the Civil War. But that doesn't mean there isn't any. <laughs> it will be interesting to find out. Yeah. Are you aware of any of the descendants of these um, people, that uh, these kids that they were brought uh, from uh, uh, Greece uh, at the time of the revolution, the United States uh, at these yeah. times? 
I, uh, you mean the descent, like, like modern descendants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I presumably there would be, um, and I, and that would be fascinating to, to know, like, what they're up to and if they're a vibrant part of the, the Greek community still. I, I don't know. That would be, that's a great question. Yeah. Very good. If there are any other questions, you are going to close it.